quantum optical master equation that describes this uh, where we have our couple of the particular oscillator at hand. to the bath of oscillators. So this is this is our master equation. Um, where kappa is the decay rate of energy out of the cavity, and n bar is the mean number of photons uh, in the background that can be into or out of the cavity. And um, what we showed, or at least loosely showed, is that if we looked at a representation of this in um, the uh, representation of the Wigner function, that the Wigner function evolves as a function of time according to the Fokker-Planck equation. So that equation has this form. has two main types of terms. This term here is called the drift term. And this term over here is called the diffusion term. In the absence of this, this would be the familiar diffusion equation. But we have this additional effect the drift term, and the drift term has the effect of uh, damping the mean value. So for example, uh, the, uh, if we were to look at how the mean position or the mean momentum decayed, we would find that there was exponential damping at the rate kappa over 2. Yeah? Is it obvious why the diffusion depends on n bar? Um, well, one thing we were, about, we were going to talk about a little bit later, but maybe I'll just foreshadow now, is, of course, this equation is familiar classically to those who are familiar with it. Meaning that this is the equation that describes Brownian motion. Okay, so we're going to talk about that some more in this lecture today. But um, the rate of diffusion of a particle in a bath is going to depend on the temperature of the bath. Um, one way to see that that uh, certainly makes intuitive sense and maybe obvious is that in steady state, the particle, if I put a, a Brownian particle grain in a liquid, if Brown did, uh, then eventually it'll come to equilibrium and the spread and momentum will be dependent on the temperature by the equipartition theorem. So uh, n bar here is, a, is basically telling you something about the temperature. Okay. 
We'll come back to that in just a little bit. Uh, so these are the evolutions of the mean position and momentum associated with the particle. Or I could think about them, the quadratures of an oscillator, like a mode of the magnetic field. It's the same equation. And of course, these this equations that come from this kind of uh, probability. So what I mean by the mean position as a function of time, one way to calculate that we know is just by looking at the distribution. That's what that is, right? That's the same thing as the trace of rho with x axis. We had discussed that uh, the nature of the Wigner function was such that any symmetric uh, function, operator function of the x and p would just like uh, Yes, cool. Uh, the Parker Planck equation, as you have written it, is uh, invariant under reflection of x or p. Or That's both. right. And from that, can I infer directly that the uh, expectation value of x is zero? Uh, in steady state, indeed. I mean, I could, I could have. So, if I started something out of equilibrium, ah, and then okay. right, okay. So that's really right. the, it's all about the dynamic. You start out of equilibrium, and this is the return to equilibrium. But you can always uh, uh, have W decomposed in terms of its parts. And so that would seem like maybe the symmetric and anti-symmetric parts might uh, propagate separately. Uh, right. Maybe, well, so let me think about, think about that a little bit more. I mean, this, yeah, this is a particular form of the Fokker-Planck equation. It's not the standard description of Brownian motion, for example. In Brownian motion, typically, you damp momentum, but you don't damp position. Okay? Uh, and that would correspond to a different master equation. This is what's sometimes called the quantum optical master equation. And it's invariant under the gauge rotation. But typically, that wouldn't be the case. Here, x and p are treated equally. And that is really about the nature of the coupling to the bath from which this master equation was derived. If we had a different coupling, like, for example, the coupling that is natural in thinking about the motion of a Brownian particle in a fluid, it would involve impacts and collisions, right? And then X and P are different. Whereas when we're talking about the um, leakage of a photon out of a cavity, there's a different kind of coupling. And that's why X and P are not coupled? <laughs> yeah. That's correct. There's no cross term, for example, of DX, DP, right? That is another thing that typically appears in a typical diffusion equation. You would have what's called the diffusion matrix. Uh, and you know, so you would write that as you know, D i j partial i partial j for whatever the coordinates were. And there's a diffusion matrix. This thing is diagonal on that. And that's, again, because of the nature of the coupling. If, again, if we wanted to look at other cases, it would, in some sense, would mean that there'd be some squeezing in the problem. Because it would shear on a funny direction. So, well, so in that sense, the fact that there is no coupling between x and p, in a sense, we have two uncoupled equations, one for x and one for p, because you integrate over p and you get the classical Correct. distribution. Yep. So in that sense, it's classical. Uh, 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 you know, that word is thrown or bandied around in a very loose way. I don't know what that means. Uh, I would say that this is 
classical in the sense as we will see, well, let me hold that point and I'll come back to it because it is important at some level. Um, again, as we saw, we can also see from this uh, equations, equations that uh, the um, fluctuations, for example, if I look at delta x as x minus the mean value, as always, that this damps and that's this forcing term. So that, again, same thing for P. Uh, that equation, again, follows by these definitions. You can go through it. Uh, and you, again, we saw this same kind of equation when we looked at uh, the fluctuations of the quadratures quantum mechanically, when we did that using the operators. But in some sense, it's kind of classical. We'll see what that means in a moment. Uh, and this equation, of course, for short times, for times that are short compared to the uh, damping time, then we get diffusion. The fluctuations grow linearly in time. And so this is the diffusion coefficients, typically called twice the diffusion coefficient by convention. Um, but this, it doesn't grow forever. Ultimately, uh, you will reach a steady state. And in steady state, that the fluctuation as a function of time, whatever the initial fluctuations are, will decay with the rate kappa. And then in the long term limit, uh, we will reach steady state with an exponential rise. If the temperature of the bath is zero, well then we have one half of fluctuation, which is the vacuum noise. Right. Um, now, uh, an important point about the Fokker-Planck equation, written in this form, but it would be true also in a more general form where x and p were coupled. It would just be a little bit different, is what I'm going to say, is that uh, the Fokker-Planck equation maps Gaussians to Gaussians. It's an easy thing to check. You can also just solve this by taking the Fourier transform. It's an easy uh, equation to Fourier transform and then solve in the Fourier domain and then uh, inverse Fourier transform. But if, for example, at time t equals zero, uh, my Wigner function were a Gaussian, say for example, a Gaussian uh, that 
whose covariance matrix were diagonal in X and P, although that's not necessary. If, if this is my initial distribution, then the distribution at a later time is the same thing with delta x naught go to delta x of t, delta p naught goes to delta p of t, x naught goes to x of t. And similarly for P naught. Of course, we saw this again last lecture, looking at uh, the quantum mechanical description based on the math equation. But this, in some sense, comes to your point, I mean, which is that. A Gaussian Wigner function is, in some sense, a classical Wigner function. It's positive. We can have a quantum state that's a pure state, but nonetheless is Gaussian. In fact, the only pure state which is everywhere positive, has an everywhere positive Wigner function, is a Gaussian state nothing else. Any other state of a harmonic oscillator that's pure, if it's not, if it's linear function, if it is positive, it must be Gaussian. No other choice. So what's happening in our coupling to the math is, well, we start with some Gaussian distribution. Say this was a squeeze state. What's going to happen is it's going to become some other mixed state that's a Gaussian state, where we could just think about it as the what the classical tra Brownian trajectories would do, and just have that be the description of the state. In that sense, it's purely classical. It's it, but why, where did that come from? It came from the fact that the coupling between the bath and the oscillator was linear. Because you remember that to get non-classical something, you need something non-linear to happen. Because we have linear coupling, everything is in some sense Gaussian and classical. But there's still something interesting in this about that about in quantum mechanics. So suppose that our initial state wasn't Gaussian. Suppose we had a state that was non-classical to start. In particular, suppose we had something that we would call a Schrodinger cat. Um, So suppose at time t equals zero, so the, the term Schrodinger cat is, everyone loves to throw that around. But what we mean when we use that term is some kind of superposition state which is macroscopic in nature. And in quantum optics, there's a few different states that we call Schrodinger cat states. One state is to say, let's imagine I have a state which is uh, some kind of superposition of coherent states. Say it's an equal superposition with some phase. And then there's some normalization constant out front. Okay. So this is a superposition of coherent states. 
And we call it a Schrodinger cat state if the overlap between these two, we know the square of this is that Gaussian is approximately zero. So they're macroscopically distinguishable coherent states. Typically, we want to call them shorter cats if also it's true that alpha is big compared to one, so that they're mac, mac, much, much bigger than one, macroscopic. Why is this? Why does it make sense to call such a state a Schrodinger cat state? Well, what we want to think about is the coherent state is, as we described last time, is kind of like a quasi-classical state. It represents a state that is a pointer state in this bath that doesn't decohere very fast, uh, that is robust and represents some possible macroscopic state of reality. And a superposition of two very different macroscopic states of reality, we call that the Schrodinger cat state. Okay. So, for example, let's consider the state which is the superposition uh, of alpha is, say, is a real number. Let's call it x naught. And alpha is minus x naught, where x naught is huge compared to 1. So in normalized units, remember x naught here, if I were to think about this as a massive particle, the dimensionless quadrature variable x is the position in units of the width of the ground state of the harmonic oscillator. Okay? So uh, if I were to look at this, what I'm saying is that the wave function for this particle, if I look at the square of the wave function is function of x, I have the particle is located localized here or localized here. And I can think about this as the physical position of a particle, if I wanted to think about it as a massive particle. And I'm not, this is not a very short or caddy-like state, although it's pretty short or caddy, in the sense that the separation between these two is huge compared to the uncertainty. That's what this means in these units. Okay. And that's why it's 1 over square root of 2? In this case, it's approximate. I mean, of course, it's not really. It's, it's a tiny or really should have that exponential thing. Okay. Uh, right, minus two. Okay. So uh, we studied this, we meaning you, uh, in homework. And we calculated the Wigner function for this state, right? Uh, the Wigner function for this state is the following. Um, it's approximately equal to one half the Wigner function called V. W plus 
this are the Wigner functions associated with these two Gaussian wave packets. They're just Gaussians that are uh, localized. this Wigner function and what's interesting about it is this term. It is this term that corresponds to the fact that we have coherence, that we have are in a superposition of these two states. In contrast, let's just write it over here, in contrast, let's consider dead or alive, where this is a statistical mixture of the two alternatives. Okay, so this state differs from this state in that it has a superposition, and that superposition is encoded in these interference fringes in the phase mix. In fact, of course, as we see, there's thing is not everywhere positive, it's positive and negative, indicating this non-classicality. And if you were to sketch the bigger function, It would look as follows. You have these Gaussian coherent state like things located at plus or minus x naught. That's the dead or alive Wigner function. But the Schrodinger cat Wigner function has, in addition, there's this Gaussian modulation of these fringes. Right? That's this term. And the period of those fringes decreases with x naught. Right? The period of oscillation is proportional to 1 over x naught. So the bigger, the more, the, the more separated you are. Uh, in X, the faster these fringes are along P. And this, what you might call this, I mean, if this, the, these coherent states are of order, you know, they have phase space area. That is about H bar. Whereas these fringes, are sometimes called subplank structure. And the subplankian structure in the figure function is a reflection of the cattiness of my state. The more <coughs> macroscopically different those states are, the finer and finer and finer and finer and finer those grains are in the figure function. So now I ask you, what happens now? So suppose I prepared this state. I did it by hook or by crook, and I'm going to tell you about the crooks and hooks that do it. They're not crooks at all. They have nipple prizes. <laughs> they didn't steal. Um, and now the system is uh, exposed to the ravaging effects of the environment, of the, the bath. What is going to happen to the bigger function? Well, it evolves according to the Falker Planck equation. And the Falker Planck equation has two effects that we 
denoted. One is what we call the drift term. And the drift term corresponded to the thing that corresponded to decay of the energy. Decay of the amplitude of the oscillator and thus decay of the energy. So, you know, each one of these possibilities, dead or alive, is going to drift towards the origin. And the rate at which it drifts is kappa. I mean, these two guys are also going to drift a little bit towards the origin, right? For kappa over two. But there's also diffusion. Now, the diffusion will cause this thing to spread out a little bit if the path is not at zero temperature. But what about these guys? Well, they're going to diffuse. And if they diffuse and they spread out, well, then they go away. In which case, the system has decohered to the two choices, dead or alive. And so now the question is, how fast does that happen? How fast does the, those, all those little ripples diffuse out and wash out to the point where this has become essentially flat and I've lost the coherence? Well, that's easy to estimate because we know the diffusion equation. So the diffusion equation says that you know the the state evolves the, the, the change in this of uh, the space function of time is related to the second derivative of the function with oops So, well, e these terms, you know, they're the Gaussians. These, the dead or alive choices, they're the Gaussians. We know how they diffuse. But what about this? Well, if x naught is huge compared to 1, well, the derivative of this term is going to completely dominate over the derivatives of that term. This will be there, but it's just going to be a small contribution. <coughs> And what we can see from this is that this is going to be proportional to kappa x naught squared times the function itself again, or minus that. But the key point here is that because we had fine structure, because that curvature was so much sharper, it diffuses much faster. And the rate at which it diffuses depends on x naught. So we can ask the question, if I really wanted to make a Schrodinger cat state, where I had, I thought about this, let's suppose this was a macroscopic superposition. Suppose I had a particle that was, had a mass of a gram that was separated by a centimeter, and I prepared it that way, how fast would this thing dissipate? Well, we can take a look at that. Let's say that it's at, so that this is the calculation that Wojciech Zurich did, or not calculation, that the number calculation, which was one of the first things who said, OK, oh, yeah, it's clearly that's important. Um, is to just look at this this rate. So let's say that we have room temperature. We have a mass m of gram and uh, a separation. You can tell what generation for which was in because he used CGS units. Um, so let's see. Uh, what was I going to say? Oh yeah. So let's let's take a look at this. So 
this rate at which the thing is spreading here, that's this rate. Let's look at that more closely. So I'm going to call the decoherence rate kappa x naught squared. And since we're at room temperature, n bar is v compared to a half. Okay. Um, so let's see. When we're at a sufficiently high temperature, n bar is approximately, we don't have to use the Planck formula anymore. It's just the Boltzmann constant by the H bar for a high temperature. That's the prime form within the high temperature limit, just to get an idea of things. So let's see, what do we have here? So this then is equal to kappa, this was the physical position in units of H bar mass omega a Boltzmann T over H bar omega, which is equal to uh, kappa x naught squared divided by uh, H bar m T. Okay. You recognize this? It's been a long time since we took sophomore physics, but something called the Broglie wavelength. All right? So this is the separation in physical units divided by the Broglie wavelength for particle that mass with that temperature squared. Uh, there's an H bar squared in there, but. So, um, this is correct in this, you know, kind of way. So now the question is, how big is the boy wavelength for a one gram particle at room temperature? Well, you've got to calculate that, kind of a crazy thing. But the bottom line is the following. The rate of decoherence relative to kappa for this, for a particle that's macroscopic of mass, yeah. if x naught is, is a centimeter, is 10 to the fourth. That is to say, the rate at which those fringes disappear is 10 to the 40th times larger than the time scale for the system to lose energy. So the effect of the bath instantaneously, for all intents and purposes, decoheres the system and turns it into this mixed state. Yep. But the uh, like two Gaussian things are also dissipating at that point. They are. No, they're not. No, they're dissipating at rate kappa. Not at the decoherence rate. That's the key point. The rate at which these guys decay towards the origin is kappa. But that's the drift. That's the drift. But they also dissipate. They know that you mean diffuse. diffuse yeah. But they don't diffuse at that rate because their curvature is tiny compared to the curvature of this. Yeah. Okay. So they, what we showed just before is that the rate at which these things diffuse, in fact, if, if this it's an it's a absolutely tiny diffusion rate compared to that because these things, curvature is completely small compared to that. Yes, Jacob. Um, so when you were motivating this uh, damped oscillator model, yep. you said, okay, you know, imagine that we have a cavity and there's right. an ex external mode yep. and it's leakage. But what would be the analog of that? Good um, question. I said that actually could lead in. Oh, so <laughs> what actually, how do we understand this from the point of view of the system reservoir interaction? Yeah. Okay. Uh, what we see clearly from this point of view of diffusion 
Yes, I mean, okay, fine, that's a diffusion equation and that clearly these things are going to diffuse instantaneously and for all intents and purposes. Uh, but how do I understand this from the point of view of the system math resume interaction? By the way, before I get to that, I want to mention one thing. It's not, this is also true at zero temperature. I did the calculation because it's the one boy Jack did in his one of his famous physics at AIDS articles that showed, you know, what it is. But even if we had this work a half instead of n bar, and if x naught is sufficiently large, suppose I have, I wanted to make a coherent state of two laser beams which had, you know, so many joules of energy, if the number of photons that corresponds to this coherent state, remember this is the displacement, alpha, the number of photons is n. If the number of photons is 10 to the 18, well then you square it, you get a 10 to the minus 10 to the 36. Again, a macroscopic uh, superposition of two macroscopic coherent states will decohere by this damp oscillator model essentially instantaneously. Now let's talk about that case. Let's talk about the case, the zero temperature case, because it's just easier to think about. So let's go back to what the physical model we use to derive that master equation. We have the total Hamiltonian was the Hamiltonian for the particular oscillator and we have all the bath oscillators that correspond to the modes outside the cavity that can come in. And then we had this coupling, linear coupling between annihilating a photon inside the cavity and creating one outside and the conjugate. Okay, that was our initial model that we started with. Um, so let's suppose at time t equals zero, we create a coherent superposition which is now in contact with all the vacuum modes. Okay? And now we let the two interact so there is a entangling unitary, which is this Hamiltonian. Okay. What's going to happen in this problem? Well, uh, if we, let's, we go again to the interaction picture. Uh, it's, it's easier to look at things in that manner. Uh, then, um, so these guys are stationary, we put our time dependence in here. This is e to the minus i uh, sum over j g j a d j Plus. Plus. So we should conjugate acting on this state. Okay. So what is the action of this? entangling operator on this state. Well, so again, we can uh, do the usual set baker campbell Hausdorff, separate the exponential, we'll have the creation operator, the do it in normal order. The annihilation operator does nothing to the thing, and we have the creation operator some factor out front, essentially this becomes e to the minus i 
stuff I don't care about alpha plus. This is all the zeros for all the modes of the back. Well, what does this do? Well, when I hit it on, I can write this now. This is whatever, some constant e to the minus i sum over, this should be times time. I forgot about time, my Hamiltonian. Uh, right, then I get this is a uh, alpha, right, alpha inside, alpha gk times t, bj dagger, acting on zero. plus minus alpha e to the plus i sum over all the modes alpha g j t v dagger acting on the back. Okay? Now what? Well, what is the action of this on the vacuum? This is something linear in the, in this case, the creation operator. What kind of state is this? Coherent state. It's a coherent state. This is just a displacement operator, right? So this is some, I'll call it beta vector. And this is a minus beta vector. It follows all the different, all these coefficients of all these. So there's a vector of coefficient these two get. So now the question is, are those two states of the environment distinguishable? If those two states are distinguishable, then when I trace over those states, I lose the coherence. And the question is, what determines that? Hey, well, what we see here is that this overlap between beta and minus beta we go through, I left out all the phases, and I was, I'm being a, a bit sloppier because I want to get at the center of physics and all the details of getting all the algebra right. But effectively, what you will find when you do this is that this thing is e to the minus kappa this squared, where kappa was the sum over all the modes with really all the phases in there that I have been sloppy about. Square. And what we see here is that this overlap decays exactly like what we had before. It's decaying faster than the decay rate of cavity by an amount depending on how macroscopic alpha was to begin with. So physically, what's happening is the following. The more photons are in this coherent state, the faster we can learn about which possibility it was, alpha or alpha star. Why? Well, let's draw a little picture. Let's come over here. Suppose I have a cavity. The cavity has a coherent state in that mode, 
or a coherent state in, in superposition completely 180 degrees out of phase with it. <laughs> okay, the 180 degrees out of phase, that's not bad, but you get the point by the Okay. Now, if one, only one photon leaks out of this cavity, I can tell the difference. Just one. Why? Because, well, there's a What's going to come out of it, what's going to be entangled here is something like there's some probability and there's some possibility of one photon. And there's here, there's another supervision that comes out. And that the phase of this thing, this probability amplitude, depends on this phase. I could, in principle, do a homodyne measurement on that one photon that leaked out of the cavity and determine whether it came from this field or that. And so the point here is that because we have more photons, the rate at which I can learn about the phase grows with n. One, the leakage of only one photon out of 10 to the 18 is enough for me to essentially distinguish these. Whereas if one photon leaks out of the cavity and there were 10 to the 18 to begin with, that didn't change the energy very much. So this is an example of a ubiquitous phenomenon, which is that non-classical states tend to be fragile. They tend to be the states that are the least robust to the ravages of the environment. Which is why making a quantum computer is a very hard thing to do. However, I just as a side point, what is beautiful and wonderful about the theory of quantum computing is that it's not hopeless. That if you digitize those errors, that in principle, you can protect the system from these ravages. And that was not understood from the get-go. I mean, back in, after Shor's algorithm was uh, um, discovered, created uh, by Shor, um, this argument was put forward by Bill Unruh, a famous Unruh radiation, that said, you know what? Fine, in principle, you could factor numbers by creating this massive entangled state, but the speed at which that entangled state would decohere would be exponentially faster. And any gain that you had in computational complexity would be completely lost because you couldn't get the information out. And no one at that point understood that in principle, decoherence wasn't locked in this way, that with proper encoding in the system, you could protect the system. And in my opinion, that is the most important result of the last decade or 20 years. It's all about error correction. All right. Um, now, so what, one of the things we just were describing is that um, we can think about our damped harmonic oscillator when we looked at in phase space as a kind of grounding motion. And this leads us into the last topic that I want to discuss in the context of, of uh, the damped oscillator and the general theory of open quantum systems. The picture of grounding motion connects two descriptions that we have for the dynamics. We can talk about a probability distribution. 
phase space. And that probability distribution, we call it W, whatever we want, all according to time, we have the Fokker Sun equation. Quantum mechanically, this is saying that there is a density operator, a state of the system that is a function of time and it evolves according to the master equation. And we showed at some level how the Fokker Planck equation is just a representation of this. But there's another way. Classically, we can describe this Brownian motion, and that's we can think about individual stochastic random trajectories. So we can think about an individual trajectory of some particle, the oscillator, if you like, in the bath that's evolving non-deterministically. And it's evolving non-deterministically because we're not keeping all the information about how the bath is correlated with it. Now, quantum mechanically, That's a Heisenberg picture. We have talked about open quantum systems solely in the Schrodinger picture. What about the Heisenberg picture? How do we deal with the Heisenberg picture? The Heisenberg picture for open quantum systems is both easier and harder. Explains <laughs> my way to mean by that. Um, firstly, let's just look, let's motivate this a little bit by considering the following. So in the damped oscillator, we sh showed, for example, that the mean field decayed. So you might say, let's put, let's just for being a little bit more general about this and, and clearer perhaps, let's go back to the, uh, not in the rotating frame, let's put that in the free evolution. So you might, so we have the solution that this evolves according to time as a rotating phaser that is decaying. Now you might guess then that the Heisenberg picture description should be that the Heisenberg operator not only has the usual free evolution but also has a damped evolution. That's a guess for what we might expect the Heisenberg evolution of the operator A should be for the damped oscillator. But there's a problem there, and it's the uncertainty principle. Because uh, if you look at, of course, the equal time commutator between A and A dagger, that decays. And if t goes to infinity, this is 0. So that's not a good thing. It means that we're not, preserve, if we, not preserving the quantum commutators, then we're not preserving in any way that is clear the uncertainty principle. 
we have to go back and think about deriving the Heisenberg picture from, from first principles and then just guessing. Uh, and we are uh, motivated by that. We have analogy to that by thinking about the, the classical solution for these stochastic trajectories. So that's what I want to introduce for the last 10 minutes of this lecture, and we'll finish that next week. So let's talk a little bit about um, ground in motion. What do I mean by that? So let's just talk about the classical. classical problem is the following. We have some kind of fluid, and we have some, in, some kind of grain or some kind of particle that's sitting inside that fluid. And what one finds is that as the particle moves through the fluid, Of course, it experiences drag due to the viscosity of the fluid. And that drag, of course, will opposite, opposite its momentum. In addition, what was weird when it was observed was that in addition to this drag, one found that this particle underwent some kind of randomness, some kind of stochasticity in its trajectory. And it was ultimately an important uh, piece of the puzzle in unraveling the idea of the atomistic view of matter that these random trajectories of this particle were due to discrete impulses of atoms or molecules in the fluid. And so uh, if I blow this up a little bit, there are, of course, all these collisions that are happening with this particle. This is the kind of thing we motivated before when we're talking about open open quantum systems when we think about just thermal thermal But now I'm talking about the motion of this problem. And uh, what, was, what one can then say is that, well, whatever the equation of motion, let's just say this in 1D, of this particle, it's, it's how its momentum is changing as a function of time, there's some stochastic force. That stochastic force is coming from the random collisions whose details I don't know, but I know statistically what's going on. And so I can write this in two pieces. A piece that's whatever the average force is, or whatever the probability distribution is for different forces given the path, plus a fluctuating term. Okay. So I can always break up any variable, any random variable, as whatever its mean value is over the probability distribution uh, plus the remainder, which is the fluctuation. The mean field, we know, gives rise to damping, drag. So we have a differential equation, a stochastic differential equation, for how the equation of motion for how the particle moves as a function of time. Its momentum is damped 
by some amount. That's, and then in addition, there is Keep thinking I'm going to do a vector equation, but I'm not. Somehow, when you write down force, you got to put a vector sign over it. Uh, this kind of equation is known as the Langevin equation. Langevin, first wrote this down. Study this kind of description of gravity and motion. In order to make any sense of this, we need to say something about the nature of this fluctuating force. So the fluctuating force, by its very nature, first of all, fluctuations, are, its mean value is zero. So this is averaged over the distribution of forces. And in the same way that we argued relative to our description of the derivation of the master equation, when we think about this classically, what we're saying again, we want to look at the case where um, the drag time is, the damping time is very, very, very long compared to the time of re-thermalization of the molecules in the collisions. The same argument about our correlation time. So in the Markov approximation, the fluctuations are delta correlated in time. Of course, there's really a correlation time, but that correlation time is assumed to be essentially zero relative to the damping time. So this is a delta function. And the strength of the delta function is traditionally called 2D for reasons that will maybe become clear in a moment. We saw 2D earlier. Okay, so that's the Markov approximation. Delta correlation in the force of the line of mass force. Well, now we can solve these equations in average. At least we can solve for some of those things. So for example, if I wanted to ask, how does the mean momentum uh, change as a function of time on average? This is now averaging over the, uh, the bath forces. Well, that's this, because this average is zero. And so on average, it damps. That's what we expect. But now we can also ask about the fluctuations. Well, to do that, let's do a formal integration of this equation. Let's go with the solution. 
Uh, okay, so um, let's leave this out and let's look now at the um, how the fluctuations in momentum change as a function of time. We look at the difference between the average value and the value at square. That is going to be equal to the double. This correlation function is the delta function. This becomes 2d delta p minus d prime. And so what we find is that um, this solution, that's right, yeah. So this solution, delta p squared, as a function of time, is equal to 2d integral t0 to t dt prime e to the minus 2 gamma t minus c prime. When delta t, this should be a t prime t delta prime. Right? So this solution is 2d uh, over 2 gamma, 1 minus e to the minus 2 gamma, t minus 2 gamma. So the solution to a Langevin equation is exactly the solution that we saw from the Fokker Planck equation. For short times, when t minus t naught is very small compared to gamma, but big compared to the correlation time. Well then, what we find is that uh, these fluctuations, rho, like diffusion. Factors of two are messed up somewhere, but I don't know where. Right? Oh no, it should be two gamma. Yeah, good. When I expand that exponential. And when t minus t naught is huge compared to gamma, then this thing becomes d over gamma. So finally, this is the steady state solution. In steady state, assu assuming a bath at temperature t, what is the fluctuation momentum. The echo-partition theorem tells us what that is. Because this is just each component. We have the average p squared. The mean that goes to zero is p squared over 2 m. So this is 1 half k Boltzmann times the temperature over the mass. Or times the mass. Two, so it's this. And so what we see here is the following. Just on based on the simple model, we get a, the beautiful relation of fluctuation dissipation. To summarize, there's one thing going on. This Brownian particle is being bombarded by all the molecules in the fluid. That has two effects on the particle. One is to cause drag. The other is to cause fluctuations. So clearly those two phenomena are interrelated. And the strength of the diffusion is interrelated with the strength of the damping. The rate at which the problem dissipates is not independent 
of the rate at which it diffuses. Okay. Um, and what we see here is that there are two effects of the bath. One is the damping and the other is the fluctuations. If we go back to our Heisenberg picture question, what we put in in our guess was the damping, the drag, but we didn't put in appropriately the effect of the fluctuations that affect the Heisenberg equations of motion. You can't have one without the other. The fluctuation dissipation theorem tells you that they are interrelated. So if you are going to have damping of your quantum system, you also are inducing additional fluctuations into the system. And so we need to think about what the equivalent of the Langevin force operator is in the Heisenberg picture. And that's how you deal with the Heisenberg. But once you have that description, it's easier. Because as you may or may not know, it's always easier to deal with things in the Heisenberg picture because they're just you're not solving for every observable, you're just solving for that one observable. It's usually an easy thing to do, whereas if you're solving the Schroeder equation, you're solving the whole state, which can calculate any possible expectation value. And that's typically a much harder thing to do than to just solve, you know, this equation. Look, I did it. We want to do it. Yes? Just to start with aside, Einstein and his original paper uh, realized that the physics said that between collisions with the back yeah. particles, that the, uh, the Brownian particle had to uh, have a ballistic trajectory. Right. Those have, in fact, been seen in the last year. Oh, is that right? Yeah, the right. electronics got to be fast enough. Right, that you could actually see the, the intermediate ballistic motion. Yeah. Yeah, I, I did forget to emphasize that it was really Einstein who, some of these things are called the Einstein relation, because uh, that, that. Well, there actually was a, a student, I forgot his name, who uh, beat out Einstein uh, in terms of doing that kind of thing, but he was doing the mathematics for the stock market in France. Oh, really? Yeah. I th back in the early 20th century? I think it was the late, uh, like the late 1800s. Yeah. All right. Quantum optical master equation describes this, uh, where we have our couple of the particular oscillator at hand. has this 
types of terms. This term here is called the drift term. And this term over here is called the diffusion term. In the absence of this, this would be the familiar diffusion equation. But we have this additional effect, the drift term. And the drift term has the effect of uh, damping the mean value. So for example, uh, the, uh, if we were to look at how the mean position or the mean momentum of x and p or just like that. Yes, please. Uh, the Parker-Planck equation, as you have written it, is uh, invariant under reflection of x or p. Or That's both. right. And from that, can I infer directly that the uh, expectation value of x is zero? Uh, in steady state, indeed. I mean, I could, I could have. So, if I started something out of equilibrium, ah, and then okay. right. So That's really the, it's all about the dynamic. You start out of equilibrium, and this is the return to equilibrium. But you can always uh, uh, have W decomposed in terms of its parts. And so that would seem like maybe the symmetric and anti-symmetric parts might uh, propagate separately. Uh, right. Maybe well, we should, let, me about, let me think about that a little bit more. I mean, this. Yeah, this is a particular form of the Farquhar-Planck equation. It's not the standard description of Brownian motion, for example. In Brownian motion, typically, you damp momentum, but you don't damp position. Okay? Uh, and that would correspond to a different master equation. This is what's sometimes called the quantum optical master equation. And it's invariant under the gauge rotation. But typically, that wouldn't be the case. Here, x and p are treated equally. And that is really about the nature of the coupling to the bath from which this master equation was derived. If we had a different coupling, like for example, the coupling that is natural in thinking about the motion of a Brownian particle in a fluid, it would involve impacts and collisions, right? And then x and p are different. Whereas when we're talking about the um, leakage of a photon out of a cavity, there's a different kind of coupling. And that's why x and p are not coupled? <laughs> yeah. That's correct. There's no cross term, for example, of dx dp, right? That is another thing that typically appears in a typical diffusion equation. You would have what's called the diffusion matrix. Uh, and you know, so you would write that as you know, dij partial i partial j for whatever the coordinates were. And there's a diffusion matrix. This thing is diagonal on that. And that's, again, because of the nature of the coupling. If, again, if we wanted to look at other cases, it would, in some sense, would mean that there'd be some decay, we would find that there was exponential damping at the rate kappa over 2. Okay. Yeah? Is it obvious why the diffusion depends on n bar? Um, well, one thing we were about we were going to talk about a little bit later, but maybe I'll just foreshadow now, is of course this equation is familiar classically to those who are familiar with it. Meaning that this is the equation that describes Brownian motion. Okay, so we're gonna talk about that some more in this lecture today. But um, the 
rate of diffusion of a particle in a bath is going to depend on the temperature of the bath. Um, one way to see that that's uh, certainly makes intuitive sense and maybe obvious is that in steady state, the particle, if I put a, a Brownian particle of grain in a liquid, if Brown did, uh, then eventually it'll come to equilibrium and the spread and momentum will be dependent on the temperature by the competition theorem. So uh, n bar here is, a, is basically telling you something about the temperature. We'll come back to that in just a little bit. Uh, so these are the evolutions of the mean position and momentum associated with the particle. Or I could think about them, the quadratures of an oscillator like a mode of the magnetic field, it's the same equation. And of course, these, this equation is that come from this kind of uh, probability. So what I mean by the mean position as a function of time, one way to calculate that we know is just by looking at the distribution. That's what that is. Right? That's the same thing as the trace of rho with x hat. We had discussed that uh, the nature of the Wigner function was such that any symmetric uh, function, operator function, of the squeezing in the problem, because it would shear on a funny direction. So, well, so in that sense, the fact that there is no coupling between x and p, in a sense, we have two uncoupled equations, one for x and one for p, because you integrate over p and you get the classical Correct. solution. Yep. So in that sense, it's classical? Uh, 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 you know, that word is thrown or bandied around in a very loose way. I don't know what that means. Uh, I would say that this is classical in the sense, as we will see, well, let me hold that point and I'll come back to it, because it is important at some level. Um, again, as we saw, we can also see from this uh, equations, equations that uh, the um, Fluctuations, for example, if I look at delta x as x minus the mean value, as always, that this damps and that's this forcing term. So that, again, same thing for P. Uh, that equation, again, follows by these definitions. You can go through it. Uh, and you, again, we saw this same kind of equation when we looked at uh, the fluctuations of the quadratures quantum mechanically, when we did that using the operators. But in some sense, it's kind of classical. We'll see what that means in a moment. Uh, and this equation, of course, for short times, for times that are short compared to the uh, damping time, then we get diffusion. The fluctuations grow linearly in time. And so this is the diffusion coefficients, typically called twice the diffusion coefficient by convention. Um, but this, it doesn't grow forever, 
ultimately uh, you will reach a steady state and in steady state that the fluctuation as a function of time, whatever the initial fluctuations are, will decay with the rate kappa. And then in the long-term limit, uh, we will reach steady state with an exponential rise. If the temperature of the bath is zero, well then we have one half of fluctuation, which is the vacuum noise. Right. Um, now, uh, an important point about the Fokker Planck equation written in this form, but it would be true also in a more general form where x and p were coupled. It would just be a little bit different. Here's what I'm going to say is that uh, the Fokker Planck equation maps Gaussians to Gaussians. It's an easy thing to check. You can also just solve this by taking the Fourier transform. It's an easy uh, equation to Fourier transform and then solve in the Fourier domain and then uh, inverse Fourier transform. But if, for example, at time t equals zero, uh, my Wigner function were a Gaussian, say for example, a Gaussian uh, that whose covariance matrix were diagonal in X and P, although that's not necessary. If, if this is my initial distribution, then the distribution at a later time is the same thing with delta x naught go to delta x of t, delta 